Commerce. We're very excited for today's event. Before I hand things over to Representative Craig, I'd like to go over the agenda and a couple of ground rules for today's town hall. In a few moments, Angie will provide a brief update on her work in Congress. Then Dr. Kumi Smith will give a brief update on the coronavirus pandemic. Following those remarks, I'll be asking questions that you've submitted. I would like to also remind you that everyone on this town hall, we go by Minnesota rules here. That means we're going to treat each other with respect. Tough questions are encouraged, but obscenity is not allowed and inappropriate or mean-spirited questions will not be asked. Now, as we begin, I'm gonna start things off with the Pledge of Allegiance. So please stand with me and place your right hand over your heart. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thanks for joining me with that. And with that, I'll hand it off to Angie for her opening remarks. Thanks. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer. It's such an honor and a privilege to be back with everyone here uh, this evening. And Jennifer, thank you for everything that you do for the small business community, especially in the city of Burnsville. I know that uh, the community has been working really hard to help as many small businesses as, as possible over the course of this public health crisis. I always start my town halls by saying thank you to uh, the veterans in our community. And this Thanksgiving especially, I want us to be uh, thankful for and think about all of uh, those veterans, uh, all of those active service members who uh, are deployed. I know we've got some National Guard deployed as well to help with this public health uh, crisis too. And so, and their families, there's gonna be an empty place uh, at the Thanksgiving table for them. Uh, and we're all able to uh, spend time with our family because they serve our communities. Before I jump into any opening remarks, I wanna say uh, a special thank you to Dr. Kumi Smith for being back uh, here with us. Um, I'm so grateful that you're able to lend your medical expertise. And of course, this is a, a really a critical time uh, in the public health crisis here in Minnesota, as we see some of the highest uh, rates of positivity back here in Minnesota across the country. I said in my remarks uh, to Dr. Smith privately that I had hoped that we'd be back in person, that uh, we'd all uh, not need a public health expert with us uh, at every single town hall, but uh, this is where we are. And so I'm so grateful that you agreed to come back with us here tonight. Uh, for those of you who are participating uh, in your first town hall, um, this is my 35th town hall since being elected to the United States Congress. I'm incredibly happy to be with you here tonight. I hope uh, that uh, we all get together in uh, person again for these town halls very soon. Uh, but I want to say a little bit more about that in just a second. But uh, just so I don't forget later, I want to wish everyone here a, a very happy Thanksgiving. I know that it has been a, a challenging last year, but hopefully uh, we're, you're vaccinated, you're able to get back together with family, with friends here over the course of this week and spend some incredibly special time with family. As most of you know, we've been holding these events virtually for the, the last several months, I guess since a year ago in the spring. When the pandemic first began, uh, we hoped uh, that it would only be for a bit out of an abundance of caution, we took our town halls uh, virtual. Uh, we've learned a lot over the course of the last little bit on uh, how to do virtual town halls. A lot of, uh, we've had our, our share of technical issues, just like those of you who've had to work on Zoom uh, have over the last little bit. Um, when we made that decision, I, I didn't think we'd be sitting here more than a year later, uh, still virtual, but obviously with the positivity rate in Minnesota above 10%, there's just no way to, to safely uh, get back together here at this point in time. I, I did one of those set uh, some criteria out uh, for when I would expect us to get uh, back together in person. And of course that will completely depend upon where the public health crisis uh, takes us. But um, we put some guidelines together um, the positivity rate, uh, we would uh, like to see that uh, below 5% uh, before we'd be willing to do an, an in-person uh, town hall 
uh, again and consider gathering in person. We've also discovered and received feedback from many of you over the course uh, of the pandemic that there's additional accessibility uh, by doing uh, these online. And so I think when we come back together, we'll probably do a bit of a mix of in-person town halls uh, together, uh, virtual town halls like the format you're seeing here this evening, and uh, perhaps even tele-town halls. I know um, to me, it was really important uh, that uh, I get together uh, with each of you on a monthly basis to hear your direct feedback. That's proven to be incredibly valuable to me in addition uh, to all of the um, tasks for, task force and advisory groups that uh, we've put together over the course of the last few years. I'll start with a question and answer portion here in, in just a few minutes, but before we uh, kick that off, I just want to spend a few minutes telling you what's been going on in Washington over the last uh, few weeks because uh, it's been incredibly busy. Last Monday, President Biden uh, invited a bipartisan group of lawmakers uh, to the lawn uh, in front of the White House where uh, we watched uh, him sign into law really a truly historic bipartisan, bipartisan infrastructure bill, funding for our highways, our roads, our bridges, and really importantly for Minnesota too, for broadband, high-speed internet. You know, any bill in Washington that can get uh, 60 senators to vote for it uh, is a good bill, but any bill that can get almost 70 is really an extraordinary bill. And that's exactly what the bipartisan infrastructure bill accomplished. And on Friday, my colleagues and I on uh, the House side voted, uh, I think by seven votes to pass the Build Back Better Act. We talked a little bit uh, about this bill here in the recent past as it was being developed, but um, some of you may have seen that I've really been in the middle of the fight to make sure that uh, prescription drug costs, uh, lowering prescription drug costs, making sure that Medicare could negotiate drug prices has been part of that bill. And I'm really um, pleased to see that the final bill that passed the US House on Friday um, will bring down things like the cost of healthcare and prescription drugs, It'll support working families, as well as provide uh, for uh, development in our rural communities and for family farmers. More than anything else in the bill, uh, if, if we can get this one over the finish line, I think it's really important to understand that this is going to lower the cost of big ticket items for Americans, things like healthcare, things like childcare, daycare, uh, three and four year olds having access to preschool. Um, it is a bill that really is intended to get at the cost side of the family budget. And it's a bill that proudly, um, I believe is really built around working families in the middle class, which of course we haven't always seen uh, Washington do that. Um, not only is it uh, prescription drug reforms uh, and gives Medicare the power to negotiate, but for seniors in our community, it puts a hard cap on uh, the amount of prescription drug costs that our seniors would pay at $2,000 and incredibly important for um, those who've lost family members due to rationing of drugs like insulin. It caps the cost of insulin at uh, $35 per month and just incredibly uh, important. It also lowers the cost of healthcare by extending the premium tax credit. If you've been out to the individual market, the ACA Minsure recently, um, many of my constituents have been able to save $10,000 or more on their family's health insurance coverage as a result of the tax credits we put in place through the American Rescue Plan. We have extended those tax credits in the Build Back Better Act, which I think is just important to uh, our journey toward universal access to healthcare across our country. Um, expanding pre-K, I mentioned that to three and four year olds, um, the child tax credit, which was in the American Rescue Plan, extending the child tax credit, and really, really important. I know that there is a workforce shortage out there. One of the things that we have seen, obviously it's um, 
you know, it's got a lot of reasons why we've got one, but one of the things we've seen is that women have not come back into the workforce uh, at the rate of men. Um, much of that we believe is due to family responsibilities and ensuring that uh, no family in Minnesota uh, that makes less than $270,000 a year pays any more than 7% of their income on childcare, daycare, is just a huge benefit to working families across our country. You know, extending that middle-class tax cut, the child tax cut, that is gonna impact 46,000 households in just the second district alone. That is, uh, I think, 35 million households overall. So investing in affordable housing and workforce development in clean energy technologies, the largest investment we've made in clean energy and um, in certainly my lifetime will position America, position our country as a leader in the global economy. I don't know about all of you, but I've uh, said before, we're, we currently rank 13th in the world when it comes to our infrastructure in America. China has been making significant investments and I don't wanna see uh, America 13th at anything. And we are competing in a global economy. And I know that the Build Back Better Act and the infrastructure bill are gonna help us compete with nations like China. Best of all, best of all, um, it was really important to a number of us in Congress that uh, this bill be paid for and not add uh, to the United States debt or deficit. So there are a number of provisions in this bill, um, things like having corporations pay a minimum tax of 15%. I've talked before about how unfair it is that uh, the small businesses in my district have to pay their federal taxes and some large uh, global businesses pay nothing because of the loopholes we have in the U.S. tax code. Um, and so we are absolutely making sure that this is paid for. And as a result of that, experts believe, I think we have 17 global economists, uh, Moody's analytics, a lot of smart people who've said that they actually don't believe that this is going to put inflationary pressure on our country. We know inflation is an issue. It's a pandemic-induced uh, inflation issue that we can talk more about if you have uh, additional questions. But um, we know that uh, this bill, when you add it all up and you include uh, the elements in the bill of enforcing the tax laws already on the books, this bill will actually decrease, reduce the deficit by more than $100 billion over the next decade. You know, when I was elected to Congress in 2018, I, I made a promise to the people who sent me there, that I would fight to lower the cost of health care and prescription drugs, that I would expand access to early childhood education and post-secondary education, that I would invest in fixing the roads uh, of Minnesota too, um, and that I would be uh, alert in addressing the growing issue of uh, really extreme weather and a changing climate. This is what I believe the voters of the second district uh, sent us to work on. And last week we made a really important progress after uh, a lot of discussion and debate um, in order to make that happen. This bill now heads to the Senate. Um, when it comes back to the House, it won't be exactly as we sent it over uh, to the Senate. There's one big battle that remains uh, in it. Uh, I would say 90% of this bill is what we call pre-conference, which is a fancy way of saying it's already been agreed with uh, senators like Joe Manchin and uh, Senator Sinema of Arizona, but there are some major differences remaining. There is a provision in the House version that I support that would provide for four weeks uh, of paid leave uh, to working families when they have a child. And I just, uh, one more time, some of you may have seen, I tweeted out a photo uh, because I look for any opportunity to mention my new grandson, Noah, uh, tweeted out a photo a couple of weeks ago to, to Senator Manchin reminding him, and so I'll just remind all of you that most daycares will not even accept a newborn until they are at least six weeks old. And so families across our nation today are having to make that really tough decision. Do I go back to work as a working mom or 
uh, father, or do I struggle to pay the rent, to pay the mortgage, to buy groceries? And so uh, four weeks is not nearly long enough. That is the compromise that we've offered up. Um, and we are the only um, developed nation that really doesn't offer any paid leave uh, to working families when they uh, have children. So that is uh, an element of the bill that I will continue to fight for and be vocal about. And I hope if you agree with me that you'll do the same by contacting our senators and making sure that they know now that it's on the Senate side that you want them to work really hard to make sure that that comes back to the House in the final package. With that, Jennifer, um, that's just the last three weeks uh, of uh, serving in Congress. Uh, it's been a really busy November. Uh, and with that and the uh, positivity rate and COVID spiking in Minnesota, I'll turn it back over to you, Jennifer, for Q&A. And uh, Dr. Smith, again, just thank you from the bottom of my heart for being here and lending uh, your expertise. Thank you, Congresswoman Craig and uh, Dr. Smith. We'll be with Dr. Smith in just a minute. The first question we have online is for Angie. Uh, Karen asks, what can be done about protecting voting rights? I feel that all the great work this Congress has passed will be for naught if we are no longer fully a fully functioning democracy. Well, Karen, thank you so much for the um, really excellent question. I, let me just say that uh, I believe this actually is the number one issue um, that we need to tackle. We, we got the Build Back Better Act across the finish line uh, here in the House last Friday. And as we think about um, the Freedom to Vote Act, which is, of course, a bill uh, that uh, is over in the Senate, what we're talking about when, when we talk, use fancy words, when I use fancy words like democracy is just making sure people can get to the ballot box. Good common sense, uh, you know, federal baseline, baseline for voting across our country. And honestly, you don't have to look very far than Minnesota, which often has the very top rate of voter participation in our, uh, in our nation to find a good model, right? 45 days of uh, in-person early voting, no excuse, absentee balloting, same day voter registration. All of those things increase turnout, which in turn increases our democracy, builds our democracy because uh, we, we make sure every voice is heard when we, we choose our state representative or our state senator or our US congresswoman or our governor or our president. And in many states across this nation, sadly, we've seen uh, a real rise in um, legislatures that are sort of picking and choosing who they want to get to the ballot box and frankly making it as hard as possible for working folks, working Americans um, to get there. If uh, you work, uh, um, you know, uh, during the day and you're, you know, you don't have early vote or you're, uh, you have to take off and lose a little bit of your paycheck on election day, if you choose to vote uh, uh, on election day, if you don't ha have alternatives when you don't have a weekend voting hours. It just makes it really hard for people to get uh, to the ballot box. And um, what I would say, Karen, is that um, obviously that now that Build Back Better is across the finish line, that bill is going to help uh, the economy with the cost side of the equation. If we lower health care costs, if we um, focus on pre-K for three and four-year-olds, people can get back to work. If we look at uh, the needs for child care, daycare, all that is good, but we need to make sure that uh, we get the Freedom to Vote Act across the finish line in the Senate. And as many of you have heard me talk about before, and if we were live, just if those of you are new here, I'd be deemed because I've probably gone over two minutes now. Um, those of you know that in order to get past the filibuster, uh, which is really an arcane rule over in the Senate, um, which means you got to get 60 votes even to start debate on a bill. Um, we're going to have to, we're, we're going to have to reform the filibuster or in the filibuster in the Senate. I, I don't believe for a minute that our founders believed um, that the minority could stop the majority from the will of the people. And so Karen, um, you know, I was at the White House a few weeks ago I think that, um, you know, the 
administration understands that this is a, a significant priority and it really is a huge issue for us. And um, I, I do hope that uh, the administration makes this a, a very, very high priority moving forward. Thank you, Congresswoman Craig. Uh, this next question is for Dr. Smith. Dr. Smith, Minnesota recently had the highest rate of COVID infection in the country. What were some of the factors that contributed to that? Are we doing something wrong? Thanks, Jennifer, and thank you to Congressman Craig for having me. It's really nice to see everyone. Um, although we have been joking uh, in the back channels that you know you never see an epidemiologist uh, when they have something good to share. So I'm here mostly to um, hopefully share you with you some information and equip you with knowledge um, rather than to just depress you. Um, but this is a really great question that has been coming up uh, because Minnesota really is standing out at the national level right now. Um, to get to the main question, which is what are we doing wrong? The answer is we don't know. We really have no idea what is going on. Um, I will remind everyone that what we're dealing with right now is a Delta demic. This is a completely new virus uh, as compared to what we were all dealing with last year around this time. So this is really new and uncharted ter territory. Um, but the case rates and the trends that we've been seeing in Minnesota and the upper Midwest have been mirroring that that we're seeing in Europe where elevated transmission has been persisting for some time in spite of pretty high vaccination rates. So we're learning from what's happening over in Europe and it could be that we are the canary in the coal mine. Um, as to what possible things might be contributing, um, competing theories are in addition to the Delta pandemic is that uh, immunity, whether through natural infection, just getting sick from COVID or from uh, vaccination, the immunity you gain from those roots may be starting to wane. There's some evidence that that may that may be happening uh, all across the world. Um, and that could be leading to more and more folks who are now more susceptible and vulnerable to COVID infection. In addition, we are more open than ever before. Kids are back in school, activities are resuming, and this is really important. I'm not advocating that we uh, reverse those things immediately um, and at the drop of a hat. However, that is a factor that could be contributing to some of the trends that we're seeing. Um, so I think to that point, it's just worth noting that when risk is exposed to us as people, in the very beginning, we are so scared and we react really, really strongly. But it's a very normal thing to get used to that risk over time and to become sort of accustomed to it. It's a normal mechanism, it's just a coping mechanism. Um, but this can leave us a little bit underprepared for when the circumstances change. And that's why it's really, uh, wonderful that Representative Craig invited me on tonight so that we can have some um, sober and thoughtful conversation to reconnect with what we already know and review what's in our toolkit so that we're better prepared for what's coming. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith. That's great insight. It's very helpful. Uh, this next question is for Congresswoman Craig. Jeremy asks, you've made rural broadband access a major priority. How will the 100 million in broadband funding in the Build Back Better bill help rural communities and speed up deployment for broadband? That was a lot of bees. <laughs> There's a lot of bees in that, but uh, Jeremy, thank you for that really great question. Uh, many of you know, since um, I joined the Congress, broadband expansion has been a, a huge focus for me. And I'm really honored to be on the Energy and Commerce Committee now where communications and technology um, is in the portfolio that I work on fairly regularly. There is an overall, you're exactly right, the number for Minnesota is $100 million. But just so uh, everyone knows the scope of this across the United States, the total amount in the Build Back Better Act is actually $65 billion. And, um, you know, it's estimated that it would take $98 billion uh, to get all of America, every single corner of America um, uh, broadband. And of course, there's some technologies because of terrain that needs to be developed to get to that last, you know, probably one or 2%. But Jeremy, the, the reason why this is so critical, if you represent a district uh, like mine that includes places like Wabasha County and Goodhue County, and I would say, um, you know, Rice County, and, uh, you know, if, if, if you don't, uh, 
live in an area that has complete access to broadband, then you really are at a disadvantage when it comes to um, starting a business, when it comes to precision agriculture, being able to upload that data. I, I in, in those parts of the district, and frankly, some in, in certain pockets of Dakota and Scott and other counties, um, you know, you've got example from the pandemic of, um, of parents driving to the local McDonald's to upload uh, the, the homework or um, with at-home learning over the course of the pandemic, it's been really difficult. And Backing away from this just a little bit, I also have the opportunity uh, to serve uh, on a select committee on reducing economic disparity and fairness in growth. And if we think about rates of poverty across our nation, it's actually rural communities have the highest rates of poverty across America. And so broadband is going to help us do a couple of things. One, you can live anywhere, you could start a business anywhere, if you have access to high-speed internet. So it really does open up more choice for people uh, to live where they want to live. The other part of this has be, that's become increasingly important, as we know, is education, right? Having access to the internet becomes just 21st century infrastructure for learning. And then the third thing, and this keeps coming up a lot, is in healthcare. If we want good rural healthcare, access to broadband to high-speed internet is an absolutely critical piece of infrastructure because we have you know a, a layers and layers of challenge getting people to move to rural communities for example uh, to deliver mental health care well if you've got access to high-speed internet then you could deliver that care virtually from anywhere so jeremy to me this is about you know economic disparities, making sure that we don't leave our rural communities behind, making sure that we can reverse some of the uh, declining uh, population that our rural communities, graying populations that our rural communities have seen over the course of time, which of course has put those communities at a distinct disadvantage. So uh, thanks for the question. Uh, I'm really passionate about this topic. I think it is one of the most important investments in the Build Back Better Act is the $65 billion for high-speed internet. And that 100 million coming to Minnesota, you know, I wanna go to um, opening, uh, uh, ribbon cuttings, grand uh, openings, like I did an at uh, township and with Goodhue County officials to visit the site of a BevCom and Nuvera um, broadband build out project. Uh, there are plenty of those projects that we could be focused on around this district and I really look forward to that. Thank you, Congresswoman Craig. We all certainly did see a, a whole new light on broadband during the pandemic and, and we've become a lot more dependent on it as we are tonight. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, this next question is for Dr. Smith. Uh, Dr. Smith, how high is the risk of breakthrough infection for folks who are vaccinated, especially during the holiday season when we're around a lot of family members? How can we prevent those infections? Thanks for that question. It's a great one. Um, and something that I think we're all really thinking about as we move towards the Thanksgiving holiday. Um, so there is an impression out there, I think, among some folks that breakthrough infections are rising. Uh, and therefore, that means that the vaccines are somehow getting weaker. Um, I have some reassuring news on this front, which is that it's not so much that the vaccine efficacy is changing, it's rather about the cumulative exposures that each of us are facing in our day-to-day -day life. So as the virus is doing what it's doing right now and spreading, um, in spite of our best efforts, it does mean that Every day walking around, we are potentially exposed to COVID that many more times. So it's putting a lot more pressure on the vaccine and you're going to see a few more breakthrough infections. Um, another thing is that as we achieve higher and higher vaccine coverage, um, there is some amount of transmission going on and the, the possibility that some of that is going to uh, manifest as vaccinated people who got infected is also going to increase. So it's just a function partly of uh, what is happening in the background with the epidemic and what is happening as our vaccine coverage increases. Um, but as we move towards the holiday, the really good news I have is really to not focus so much on how much is breakthrough happening and rather to keep in mind these really, really promising facts that we have about the vaccines. 
as the epidemic has gotten worse, these vaccines have gotten tested all the harder and they really have stood the test. Um, keep in mind that the odds of infection are six times higher in those who are vaccinated or those who are unvaccinated, excuse me. And the odds of death from COVID are 12 times higher in those who are unvaccinated. Those are incredibly, incredibly protective rates. And they mean that really, as you move towards the holiday, the best thing that you can do as you think about being around family, especially in multi-generational settings, um, is, to, is to really work on talking about vaccines and seeing if there are any family members who might be willing to engage with you in conversations about perhaps uh, submitting to the vaccine, you know, pressure that we've all been putting on them and to really consider what this could mean for being together as a family and to feeling safe and happy as a family. I'll turn it back to you, Jennifer. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith. That's excellent. Um, excellent information going into this season ahead. Um, let's see, the next question I have here is for uh, Congresswoman Craig. And I'm just trying to get caught up on the questions. Let's see here. Um, Haley asks, you've been an amazing advocate for labor and a huge supporter of the PRO Act. What will you do to work with your colleagues in the Senate to get it passed? Well, Haley, thank you so much for the question and I appreciate um, the acknowledgement. I think that all of our communities are stronger when workers have the opportunity to co collectively organize. Um, the PRO Act actually stands for uh, the Protecting the Right to Organize Act and it would undo some of the harmful um, what we call right to work for less laws uh, that are uh, really popping up across our nation. Um, if you're, 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 the, the truth is um, that we're working on the Senate. Um, we have passed this bill, the PRO Act, uh, in this session as well as in the last session of Congress, but this is also subject to the filibuster, which of course means you need 60 members of the Senate um, in order to start debate on a bill like the PRO Act. So uh, I would say to you that, um, you know, I, I have a lot of colleagues uh, who show up at events, particularly events in the construction trades and in the building trades, uh, colleagues from across the aisle. What I would say, uh, Haley, is that the labor movement, labor organizations need to hold my colleagues accountable for their votes uh, if they're voting against the PRO Act. And again, you know, our own family um, really was impacted by the labor movement. My grandmother was a, um, a union worker in a shoe factory uh, growing up, when I was growing up. And um, my grandmother was an important part of my life and she helped raise us, um, you know, my, with the help of my mother after uh, my parents divorced. And so I have such great respect for the labor movement. And, you know, what I would just say for anybody out there listening, um, you know, there are a lot of jobs right now in the trades, and there are a lot of trade unions that are looking for folks to participate in apprenticeship programs uh, with them. And uh, I am a huge supporter of uh, career skills and technical education, places like DCTC here in our district, um, but also there's some amazing apprenticeship programs that are um, run by organized labor throughout Minnesota and around this country uh, where you don't just get a job, you build a career. And I was really proud to be at a press con conference recently with Congressman Dean Phillips um, and Commissioner Margaret um, Kelleher, who uh, we talked about and we had uh, different unions there talking about the fact that the infrastructure bill, the bipartisan infrastructure bill, those are local jobs. Those are gonna help build our economy. When you repair a road or a bridge, it's gotta be done by people in our community. And so I would just say there's never been a better time to consider a career in the trades. And uh, I'll even offer up that our, our oldest son, Josh, uh, is a machinist and runs a CNC machine on second shift every night, uh, Monday through Friday. Sometimes on Saturday, he gets some overtime. and. Uh, He's doing really well uh, and uh, really enjoying his life and his career. 
Thank you, Congresswoman Craig. Uh, we have another question here for Dr. Smith. Dr. Smith, uh, the question is, I'm completely vaccinated and even got my booster recently. Should I still be wearing a mask? And if so, under what circumstances? Uh, yes, a very popular question about masking, even though we're vaccinated. So um, we did just talk about how breakthrough infections uh, can and do happen. So this means someone who was vaccinated and presumably got some level of protective immunity from the vaccine, but who still gets infected. So this does happen. And the key thing to keep in mind is that with breakthrough infections, just like with natural infection, it's possible to be infected and not know it. And at the same time, to be contagious to others. So masks are really the final stopgap to prevent you from unwittingly transmitting to people around you and becoming you know, a vector of disease. So I think if you keep that in mind, it'll, it'll help you help guide you and think about where and in what circumstances masks are a good idea. Um, for me personally, I'm still wearing them when I'm in indoor spaces, especially crowded ones. Um, I wear them in grocery stores. I wear them at restaurants if I'm between tables. Um, and of course, always being mindful of, are there folks around me who might be more vulnerable to infection? It is worth recalling that um, even with the protection of vaccines, um, COVID is still a disproportionate burden for both disease and death in our older populations. And so if you are around older folks or anyone with underlying uh, comorbid conditions, um, it's really uh, a great move to be able to mask up so that you can um, protect them and spend the time that you want to with them. Thank you. All good questions going into the holidays. Uh, this next question is for Congresswoman Craig. Linda asks, now that the Build Back Better plan has been passed by the House, there will be a cap on insulin and prescription price negotiations for Medicare. What is the status of legislation addressing big pharma trying to extend patents for brand name prescriptions to prevent generics? Linda, thank you so much for uh, that question. This was, uh, as you can appreciate, this has been the number one issue, uh, lowering the cost of health care and prescription drugs since I got to Congress. And, you know, the, the compromise position, as you described it, is that Medicare will negotiate uh, first on, on 10 drugs, second, uh, it'll move to 20 drugs, we'll cap prescription drug costs for our seniors at $2,000 per year, we'll cap insulin at $35 per month. Um, but unfortunately, in the compromise version in the Build Back Better Act, we were not able to get um, what I would call an end to pay for play, uh, pay for don't play uh, generics uh, from big pharma. What happens uh, for, for some of you who don't follow this too closely is that brand name pharma, they actually pay off, um, pay money to a generic manufacturer not to come to market so they don't have to compete on price with them. And that is currently sort of a, a legal thing um, that happens out there in the healthcare marketplace. I personally um, supported when we were having these negotiations, some of you may also know that um, American pharma companies enjoy some of the longest patent exclusivity protections in the world. Right now it's 12 years for patent exclusivity. Um, and it's really easy to get a, a patent extended under our current laws. In other words, let's say we've got a blue pill that we're gonna turn to pink and we're just extended the patent. Uh, but uh, even though the um, you know, molecular, molecular value of the, the drug didn't change at all. And so it's, um, it's a real challenge. Um, you know, I'm a huge supporter of reducing the patent exclusivity to seven years because I think more competition is better. It's gonna help us reduce um, healthcare costs across our country. Um, so the legislation that would um, um, extend to patents on brand name drugs, stopping them from paying generics from come to market coming to market is not in the Build Back Better Act, although it is obviously still a bill that's been introduced and is under consideration in the US House of Representatives. And I've long been a supporter of such legislation. The other option, not that uh, it's probably more detailed than anybody wants, but um, I led the letter and the charge to the White House to say, look, you know, there's 15 of us in the House who are not going along with this bill. 
unless we allow, you know, we start down the road of Medicare price negotiation and competition uh, for brand name drugs. Um, and what I thought was an elegant way to um, solve this would be, okay, so once a patent runs out on a drug, then it's, you know, free to have to compete with all drugs on the market, right? I mean, it seems um, reasonable to me to, to say that once a patent is expired on a drug, you ought to be able to compete freely, right? Ba uh, big, big pharma wouldn't even go for that. So, look, you know, I, I, we didn't have enough votes, quite frankly, in the House to get more than what we got. In fact, I had some Democratic colleagues um, who voted against Medicare price negotiation out of the Energy and Commerce Committee that I sit on. Uh, I voted for it, and uh, that's what uh, I believe the voters of this district want. Thank you, Congresswoman Craig. Uh, we have another question here. This one is for Dr. Smith. Danny asks, the COVID case numbers are surging in rural, rural Minnesota. Goodhue County is 12th in the nation. How do we get the message out to convince unvaccinated to get vaccinated? Thanks for that question, Danny. Um, I wish it were a simple answer. Uh, and you know, we all know that this has been a, a popular field of study for way longer than this pandemic has been around, which is vaccine hesitancy and how to um, meet people where they are at in uh, addressing those hesitancies um, and helping them make a decision that they feel good about. Um, the best advice I've seen about this is to first um, try your best to turn off that feeling that this person who's not vaccinated is somehow the last thing standing in the way to safety. Um, this is a person with probably um, some conflicted feelings and who are in a relatively stressful situation. You may not be the first person who's trying to convince them to get vaccinated. Um, and another thing is, of course, if we're going to try to meet people where they're at, we have to know where they're at. So you have to listen. And that does mean asking questions and getting to the root of where you might disagree. Um, the last thing I would say is um, people are likely going to cite uh, sources uh, to justify their reasons for not getting vaccinated. And you might not agree with all these sources. You might even have some choice words for some of these uh, sources that they're pointing to. Um, but instead of attacking those or discrediting them off of hand, um, it's often better to shift the conversation over to talking about why you trust your sources. So for example, I always talk about the World Health Organization and how the one success we've had in public health uh, infectious diseases of actually eradicating the world of smallpox, which is an incredible and unprecedented step was led by public health experts in the World Health Organization. So I'm going to listen to those folks. I think those are a few pointers to try to get us started on these conversations. A final thing is uh, realize that it's not gonna be one conversation and that this might be a, a sort of a boulder that you're pushing over time and to, to be patient. Thanks for your question, Danny. Thanks, Dr. Smith. Um, this next question is for Congresswoman Craig. Ryan asks, what projects will be funded through the infrastructure plan in Minnesota? Well, thank you so much, Ryan, for the question. So uh, I think I mentioned a few of these numbers, but maybe maybe not all of them. So let me break out the numbers for you. In, in Minnesota, we've got, I think, 4.8 billion that is coming to our highways, our, our roads, our bridges, 856 billion, excuse me, a million that is going to uh, be provided for public transportation options, you know, things like the Orange Line, bus ra rapid transit that helps serve some of the suburban communities um, in Minnesota too. And then uh, 289 million for airports. So you can see it's a, it's a pretty broad array. The bill itself does not um, asterisk certain projects. So a lot of this money is gonna come to the state of Minnesota and uh, the Minnesota Department of Transportation uh, in consultation uh, with the state legislature is going to have to make some decisions about um, how to fund these things. And, you know, the, the truth is that uh, I, I want those decisions made uh, as close to the local level as possible. It, you know, should be uh, those projects that, um, you know, are most important from the perspective of uh, being evaluated for, for safety, for efficiency of movement and commute, 
um, you know, there's just a, a lots of lots of maintenance that also could be done in a fairly rapid order if we can get those priorities made and uh, you know fix the uh, fill the potholes. And of course, we got a Minnesota winter winter coming again, so we all know what happens to our roads every single winter. The other place, though, so there's not specific projects, but what I will say is over the course of the last year, I've worked with um, communities throughout Minnesota's second district to ask them, our county commissions, our local communities, what are your transportation priorities? And so there's money at the federal level in the form of grant dollars. Um, there's a particular a grant program called, called the RAISE grant. And we just last week announced uh, that there's a federal grant to Scott County coming up for uh, a US 169 interchange project um, in the city of Georgia. Lots of projects like that. If I think about, you know, the list of things that are priorities in my community, certainly Highway 13 uh, in Burnsville comes to mind. Uh, the, the Port of Savage comes to mind um, in, in Savage, again, Highway 13. Um, you know, another lane on 35 as you come into Lakeville. I mean, you know, there's, there's a, a Farmington project that's really important. And then, you know, Dakota County has a really amazing um, plan for a veteran trail in Dakota County. I think the cost of that, the total cost is about $5 million they're looking for in federal support and funding. So again, this is going to free up um, a lot of those grant programs to have an influx of money um, in order for our local communities to make the case that uh, these are specific needs and that they are most deserving of this money. So I think you'll see our local communities um, really ramp up their application process for federal grants, their work with um, the Department of Transportation here in Minnesota and the legislature to really advocate for their projects. Um, and again, all of this in the end has got to be a community partnership. Uh, you know, um, a road doesn't give a damn if you're a Democrat or a Republican. That's why, you know, uh, that's why you've got so much bipartisan support for a bill like this. Thank you, Congresswoman Craig. And I know our local county state um, appointed officials are working hard to get those shovel ready projects in, in, uh, on the table so that when the funding becomes available, we're ready to roll. Um, this next question is for Dr. Smith. Let's see, we have, um, I know that Minnesota is leading the nation right now. Oh, sorry, my, my screen just jumped. Um, let's see, bear with me for a second. Um, here we go, sorry. I know that Minnesota is leading the nation right now in new COVID cases. Is there any particular reason why? Is it one age group or a particular region or is it an outbreak happening everywhere? Uh, yeah, so this is a great question. And again, um, a one that I think that we public health experts are learning to have some humility about because we really are very puzzled at what is going on. Um, COVID vaccination rates are decently high in Minnesota, certainly higher than its neighboring uh, states. And yet we are still seeing uh, high rates. Um, I think though, what we are observing, if you do kind of stratify the population and cut them up in different ways, is that this is definitely an epidemic of the unvaccinated. And uh, where we do see vac uh, vaccine infectious uh, breakthroughs happening in those who are vaccinated, it is happening among those who are older or um, who have less uh, of a strong immune response to the immunocompromised. Um, and that has been always the case. This is true for flu vaccine. Um, flu vaccine is going to be less protective for older folks. And that's just a function of how our immune systems age as we get older, um, they mount weaker and weaker immune responses. Um, and that is how we become more and more vulnerable to infectious diseases as we get older. That said, these vaccines are so much more protective, even for the oldest age, age groups as compared to a lot of our flu vaccines. So please don't go around thinking that the vaccines that your grandparents or other older folks in your family have had uh, are not doing anything. They're doing a whole lot. However, if we look at a snapshot of Minnesota, this is where a lot of the um, breakthroughs, uh, the cases, and then the deaths are happening is those who um, are older and those who are unvaccinated. 
Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Smith. The next question is for Congresswoman Craig. Linda asks, what legislation do you hope to address or introduce in January of 2022? Linda, thank you so much uh, for that question. I, um, you know, I, I think that uh, the longer I stay in Washington, the more I realize that we have got to do uh, more um, to take on the special interests in this town. Um, you know, you see what's happening in the Build Back Better Act with uh, prescription drug um, lobby, uh, pressuring some Democrats, putting up, you know, TV ads against some Democrats in tough districts around the country, basically pre-warning us. If you vote to make us negotiate our prices, uh, that means they'll have to compete. And that means prices will come down for consumers. You know, we'll take you on in the next election. So. You know, it, it, it has become increasingly obvious to me that uh, additional legislation to prevent conflicts of interest uh, in Washington, things like making sure that uh, no member of Congress can own individual stocks, making sure that no member of Congress can um, ever serve as a registered lobbyist after they leave uh, their service to Congress, you know, little things like uh, members of Congress could book first class airfare if they want to. I think it's ridiculous on the uh, taxpayers' dime. So, you know, I'm looking, uh, number one, at uh, how do we continue to take out the conflicts of interest so that uh, the American people are just clear that the people who they elect are there to serve them, uh, not to serve themselves at some point. The other thing that I think as we turn to 2022, we have to start thinking about is the next farm bill. Um, I serve on the Energy and Commerce Committee. I serve on the Ag Committee you know, making sure that we have a strong safety net in place for Minnesota's, um, you know, family farmers and, and producers. I think that's really important. Um, diversifying our supply chain when it comes to meat processing. Um, you know, how do we incentivize, you know, farmer co-ops so that we don't, aren't so reliant on uh, two or three um, processors around our, our, our country or our state? Um, and, and how do we, uh, think about uh, putting resilience in place in our supply chain. You know, one of the factors that I see at play here, I am co-chair of the uh, Bipartisan Supply Chain Caucus in the US Congress. And I actually was even before we had significant supply chain issues. And, um, you know, it's clear to me that um, globalization, um, you know, we, we want those export markets for our global companies from the US, but having so much of our sourcing and our manufacturing outside the United States has created a real issue when it comes to, um, you know, our supply chain. And I, you know, I assert to you that so much of what we, um, what's sitting on those containers and ships uh, at the port of LA right now is coming from China, it's coming from Southeast Asia. If those uh, products have been made by Americans right here in our country, um, we'd be in a little bit better shape right now from a supply chain perspective. So, um, you know, that those are some of my thoughts uh, as we start to think about 2022 and, you know, the, the uh, you know, number of bills that uh, I work on uh, with respect to lowering the cost of health care. It's the number one topic in my portfolio of legislation, and I'm sure that that will continue to be the case. Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, we have another question here for Dr. Smith. Brian asks, when COVID booster shots were originally authorized, the eligibility was limited to those people who were most in need. As I recall, part of the reason why the eligibility was limited was because many areas of the world have large numbers of people who have not had the opportunity to obtain even a first dose. What happened to that concern? Oh, Brian, this is such a good question. It is a loaded question. Um, the ethics of vaccine distribution have been around for as long as uh, vaccines have been. And by ethics, I mean the problems with ethics. There are no easy answers with this. Um, there always has been a concern about uh, uh, vaccine access in the rest of the world, um, especially in places that can't afford to buy these vaccines and distribute them. Um, you'll remember this is a vaccine that also requires a cold chain. So it needs to be kept at very, very cold temperatures, at least for Moderna and Pfizer. That requires a lot of um, resources as well. So there is an ethical imperative for us to try to reach those who are not as lucky as we are here in the U.S. There's also a public health imperative in that the faster we are able to get more of the world 
vaccinated, the less the chance we are of new variants emerging. Uh, you'll recall that Delta came out of India at a time when transmission was really high. Um, every additional transmission from person to person gives this uh, virus a chance to mutate and for a new, uh, possibly more infectious, possibly more deadly virus to emerge. So these are the real imperatives behind global distribution. And the US actually has been participating in a program um, since early 2020, mid 2020, the COVAX program, uh, where they have been contributing a huge amount of money to ensure that we can reach the goal, which is by the end of 2021, that 20% of the global population are vaccinated. Um, it has fallen short, sadly. And that is not necessarily because we are now focused on um, boosters here. Um, it is because the political will um, and the global sort of organization is, is a potentially very difficult and some would say insurmountable goal for us to reach. Um, I think that it is a challenge that we are going to have to address had OECD countries, higher income countries, had smashing and immediate success reaching the vaccine coverage race that we were hoping for, I think that we would have been turning our attention to global distribution much sooner. Um, but that has not been the case. And I think there is, there has always been uh, a conversation in vaccine distribution about vaccine nationalism, this concept that first we tend to our own before we help the others. And this has always been a real conundrum in how we distribute vaccines. Um, I will say too that complicating this, Brian, is the fact that there is more and more evidence coming out of ongoing studies that immunity really is starting to wane after about six months and potentially to the extent that it's really starting to uh, potentially affect transmission dynamics. So it, the story has changed too in the US about you know, how are we going to continue to protect Americans um, and at the same time, I don't think attention has shifted away from the global goals, um, but it has gotten more complicated. So that's not much of a direct answer, but it's to, to um, you know, hum and haw with you about how we should really be tackling this really difficult, but really important problem. Thanks for your question. That's a complex and important issue. Thank you, Dr. Smith, uh, for that detailed answer. Uh, we're coming to our final question for tonight. And I think one that's on everybody's mind. So this question is for Congresswoman Craig. Bob asks, what is the plan to deal with inflation, fuel costs, food costs, healthcare? Please speak in specific plans, not generalities. Well, Bob, thank you so much for that question. I'm just gonna to add to the last answer that Dr. Smith gave you. Part of our supply chain challenge um, and what's causing a pandemic induced inflation in America is so much of what we source overseas, the, you know, China and Southeast Asia, they're not in as good a situation as we are from a vaccine perspective. The pandemic looks really different and they've had to reduce manufacturing in some cases, um, you know, absolutely stop manufacturing. So, you know, I think there's also an economic uh, reason why the US uh, should think about how do we help as many people as possible get that vaccine just as quickly as possible. But Bob, you're you're absolutely right. Uh, there is a um, uh, you know inflation is real. We're seeing the, you know the cost of gas go up. I was driving down 42 today. Regulars 3.15 a gallon. Uh, where where uh, I was uh, near, it, it's a little different in different parts of the district. But um, you know, let me start with gas. I, I you know I'm I'm going to just say this out loud here tonight. Is you know. Tell me why gas um, prices are up so much, right? I I've spent most of the last year and a half uh, stuck at home on Zoom. Uh, so, you know, I do think that there, um, there is something going on that we need to make sure that we stay on top and investigate the oil companies. You know, there's this saying in corporate America, never waste a good crisis. And I wanna make sure that the Biden administration is all over, um, you know, what's happening from a price perspective um, you know, I'm not, I'm not so sure that I, I trust what's happening in the price and we need to make sure that we stay all over that. I also, though, think that uh, the Biden administration needs to take a look once they look at what's happening from a price perspective and what the oil companies are doing at the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Uh, is there any of that that we need to release? Um, they need to continue to put pressure on OPEC, all of those things. We just need to be all over this. But 
you asked me to be specific. I cannot be more specific than the Build Back Better Act. It would lower the cost of health care. It would lower the cost of child care, of prescription drugs, of preschool, of daycare, all of these things. The Build Back Better Act is the most specific thing, thousands of pages of documents. It's going to help us deal with the cost side of this thing while we sort through with the private sector, because remember, uh, most of the supply chain is controlled by the private sector. Certainly, I think you've seen some improvements. And in fact, I just um, read a quote earlier today. I think it was the CEO of Walmart talking about what a significant difference already it's made uh, to have the uh, Port of LA open 24 seven. Um, in the Build Back uh, Better Act, I'm sorry, in the infrastructure bill, we put together a program that will allow uh, folks who are just a little younger than currently allowed today uh, to train to drive trucks. So Bob, I 100% I agree with you. I think we've got to be all over this because it's, it's hurting working families the most. It's hurting the middle class the most. And um, again, um, as we get the supply chain sorted, I think we have to keep asking all the right questions. Um, we have to be responsive to these issues. Uh, we have to continue to ask, you know, how does the public sector work with the private sector to make sure that we're doing this? I think we have to ask ourselves the question, how do we incentivize more manufacturing in the US? How do we incentivize, um, you know, making sure that individuals have the right skills for the jobs that exist today. Um, workforce is its own issue that I think um, obviously the chambers and others are dealing with as well. So all of this, I know it's a lot. I know Build Back Better is a lot of a, um, you know, it's a big bill, but you know, in my mind for this district, it lowers the cost of healthcare and prescription drugs. It supports working families and it helps rural communities and family farmers. And if we can do all three of those things for a district like this, um, we're going to be on our, our way uh, to really building back um, our economy. And, you know, I, I wanna acknowledge the inflation, but also it's, you know, it's, it's really easy to focus on all the things we still need to do because obviously we do. But, you know, since the beginning of the year, we've also added 5.8 million jobs. Uh, unemployment in Minnesota is back down to 3.5%. Um, you know, an awful lot has happened that's good. Um, and that means people have money to spend. And it means that the demand is exceeding supply. And so we have supply chain issues. And so we have inflation. So it's complicated, Bob, but great question. And I promise you that I'm going to stay all over it from, uh, uh, from my office. Thank you, Congresswoman Craig. And uh, I, I just want to thank Congresswoman Craig and her team for the invitation to um, be involved in this town hall tonight. And uh, obviously, Dr. Smith, for all of her hard work on her behalf. I think the one thing that I would add is um, thank you to everyone who's participating tonight, asking questions, following us on Facebook. And I encourage you to continue that. I think as Dr. Smith said in her comments, with any tough issues, it's really important that we show up, that we ask questions, whether it's of our family members or our elected and appointed officials. So I know here in Burnsville, we really promote active engagement in the community. I'm sure um, Congresswoman Craig would echo this, that please show up, please ask the questions of all of your elected and appointed officials and ask the questions and be involved. So thank you for showing up tonight. Thank you for the opportunity to participate. I'm gonna turn this back to Congresswoman Craig. Thank you. Well, Jennifer, thank you so much for moderating a great discussion. Dr. Smith, as always, uh, your insight is just invaluable and uh, really a benefit to every single one of us. In my closing remarks tonight, I just, uh, I, I was at Egan High School Earlier today, I spoke to a, a class of 12th graders, political science students. Um, and of course, I, I'm always energized as I come out of um, the classroom. But I also just want to lift up uh, the teachers, the paraprofessionals, the staff, administrators, um, you know, bus drivers, every single person working every day to keep our schools open. Um, you know, and those masks up. I mean, this is just a Herculean challenge that uh, our schools have 
taken on. Um, and that's so that our economy can, you know, uh, keep going. And we know it's been so stressful on parents. So I wanted to lift up uh, anyone associated with or keeping our kids safe and at school and learning every single day. Uh, the other group that I want to lift, lift up this evening um, is um, uh, our healthcare workers. I was at uh, Ridges Fairview uh, a week ago with Secretary Javier Becerra. He's HHS Secretary of the United States. And, um, you know, the, the hospital was diverting uh, ER patients uh, because they already had eight waiting to be admitted. And so, if you know a healthcare worker, um, if uh, uh, you you are watching what's happening here, it's not just COVID. Uh, our our um, hospitals are full of of certainly COVID patients, but um, that delayed care that we've experienced over the last uh, several months is starting to catch up with us as well. And so our ICUs are full, our ERs are full. People are waiting on beds. People are having to go to you know way away from home to get a bed and Look, I would just say to each of you, please, please think uh, about those people um, who are, you know, really busting their butt and uh, having serious mental health and, and stress issues as a result of doing this for so long. I, you know, I, I don't even, you know, know what to say you can do for them except for let's all work together. Let's care about each other enough um, to, to try to help stop this pandemic in uh, any way possible, whether that's a vaccine, whether that's a mask, um, whether that's social distancing, just um, that's the best thing we can do for our healthcare heroes at this point. And then finally, I just wanna say um, thank you uh, to every single one of you. Uh, it's certainly been a challenging year for every single one of us, but um, we certainly have lots of thanks uh, that we, um, have in our own family with the birth of our first grandson Noah here almost seven weeks ago to adding a couple of uh, daughters in the form of daughters-in-law to to our family and uh, with uh, the last couple of years of challenges I just want to remind myself and each other that uh, we really do no matter what you say don't you know and and see on Twitter I know because I'm out talking to every single one of you all the time that we very much have more in common than we do that separates us. So thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. I wish you all wonderful time with friends and family. Thanks, everybody.